A child's skeleton was found in a cave in Israel, and it shattered everything we thought we knew about human history. At first glance, the skull looked like it belonged to an early Homo sapiens, but the jaw was thick, the brow heavy, the features strangely familiar. This wasn't just one species. This was both, a hybrid child, part modern human, part Neanderthal. For decades, we were told a simple story. Homo sapiens replaced Neanderthals in a straight march of progress. But this discovery told a very different tale, one of mixing, sharing, and surviving together. A story where the line between us and them begins to blur. For most of us, the story of human evolution was told like a history textbook with a Hollywood ending. The plot seemed simple. Once upon a time, Homo sapiens emerged in Africa, spread out across the world, and eventually ran into the Neanderthals. Then, in this neat little tale, sapiens outsmarted, outlasted, and replaced their distant cousins. Roll credits. We're left as the last species standing, the unquestioned rulers of the planet. It's the kind of story that feels satisfying, straightforward, even comforting. We like clean arcs with beginnings, middles, and triumphant ends. Humanity's rise is framed like the story of a lone hero, us, surviving against all odds and stepping into our destiny as the dominant species. But here's the problem. Nature doesn't follow screenwriting rules. Evolution is not a movie where the hero defeats the villain and walks away victorious. It's not linear, and it's definitely not clean. The deeper scientists dig, both into caves and into DNA, the messier the truth becomes. Instead of one clear timeline, what we find is a tangle of encounters, relationships and unexpected twists still. That neat little story stuck around for decades because it was easy to teach, easy to remember, and easy to believe. After all, who doesn't like a tale of survival and triumph? But the reality is much stranger, and in many ways, far more fascinating than the heroic saga we've been sold. And then came one discovery, a skeleton buried in a dusty cave in Israel that forced us to confront how wrong, or at least how incomplete, that simple story really was. The heroic march of sapiens sounds convincing, but once you scratch the surface, it starts to crumble. Evolution doesn't happen in tidy steps. It's a messy experiment running on trial and error. And when we look closely at the evidence, the old narrative feels more like a myth we told ourselves than an accurate history. For one, Neanderthals weren't the brutish cavemen we used to imagine. They were intelligent, resourceful, and incredibly well adapted to the brutal Ice Age climate. They mastered fire, crafted finely made stone tools, and likely performed rituals for their dead. They weren't losers of evolution waiting to be replaced. They were thriving in Europe and Western Asia long before sapiens arrived. At the same time, Homo sapiens weren't destiny's chosen ones. Yes, they were imaginative and creative, with cave art and symbolic thinking that gave them an edge. But stepping out of Africa into new lands wasn't a guaranteed success. Climate shifts, food shortages, and competition with other species made survival a gamble. Not a given. So instead of a single dramatic showdown where one species outcompeted the other, the evidence points to something much more complicated. Sapiens and Neanderthals didn't just fight. They lived side by side, hunted the same prey, and sometimes, quite literally, became family. The more fossils and genetic data scientists uncover, the more the story looks less like a straight line and more like a web. Crossings, encounters, and exchanges spread out over thousands of years. And the turning point in rewriting this story came from an unexpected place, a skeleton of a child whose features were split between two worlds. In the 1930s, inside a cave on Mount Carmel in Israel, archaeologists uncovered something extraordinary. At first, it looked like an ordinary early Homo sapiens fossil, the remains of a child, about 12 or 13 years old, buried alongside tools, animal bones, and evidence of ancient campfires. But when researchers studied the skull in detail, something didn't fit. The forehead was high and rounded, just like a modern human's. But the jaw, thick and powerful. The eye sockets, large and deep reminiscent of a Neanderthal's. This wasn't a clean match for either species. It was a mosaic, a hybrid child. For decades, the fossil sat in scientific debate. But with modern dating methods and new genetic insights, its true significance became clear. 
This child lived around 140,000 years ago. That's shocking, because for years, scientists believed sapiens and Neanderthals only began mixing about 50,000 or 60,000 years ago in Europe. The school child pushed that timeline back almost 100,000 years. In other words, the romance between sapiens and Neanderthals wasn't a late, isolated event. It was happening much earlier. In the Levant, the natural corridor connecting Africa, Europe, and Asia. The neat story of sapiens replacing Neanderthals like one team defeating another in a championship suddenly collapsed. What we had instead was something far more complex. Repeated encounters, long coexistence, and shared bloodlines. The school child is more than a fossil. It's a reminder that the story of humanity isn't about one species conquering another, but about two worlds meeting and leaving echoes of their union inside us. When most people picture Neanderthals, they imagine a clumsy caveman with a club in hand and a permanent scowl. For decades, popular culture painted them as our primitive, dim-witted cousins, a species destined to fade as soon as sapiens showed up. But the closer we look, the more this stereotype falls apart. Neanderthals weren't evolutionary failures. They were survivors, strong, adaptable, and incredibly well-suited to their world. Neanderthals emerged around 400,000 years ago and spread across Europe and Western Asia, territories that were anything but welcoming. Ice Age winters were brutal. Resources were scarce. Gigantic animals like mammoths and bison roamed the landscape, and survival demanded both strength and strategy. Neanderthals had both. Their bodies were built for endurance. Broad chests, thick bones, and powerful muscles. They weren't clumsy. They were machines designed for the cold. But survival wasn't only about muscle. They mastered fire, a tool that meant warmth, cooked food, and safety from predators. They crafted stone tools with astonishing skill. Spear points, scrapers, and knives that reveal planning and precision. Evidence suggests they also cared for their sick, buried their dead, and perhaps even engaged in rituals. Far from being beasts, they had culture. Think of them less like cavemen and more like extreme campers thriving in landscapes that would break most modern humans within days. They hunted together, organized themselves into groups, and endured some of the harshest conditions in Earth's history. So when Homo sapiens finally arrived in their territories, they weren't entering an empty stage. They were stepping into the domain of a species that had already proven itself as masters of survival. While Neanderthals embodied strength and endurance, Homo sapiens carried something different imagination. Where Neanderthals were masters of survival in the cold, sapiens were dreamers, innovators, and restless travelers. Their greatest advantage wasn't in their muscles, but in their minds. By about 200,000 years ago, sapiens were thriving in Africa. Unlike Neanderthals, who tended to adapt to specific environments, sapiens were explorers, constantly moving, experimenting, and reshaping the world around them. They weren't stronger than Neanderthals. In fact, their bodies were generally leaner and less robust, but they were astonishingly versatile. Evidence of this versatility lies in their tools and art. Sapiens created more than just functional weapons. They made tools with multiple uses, tailored for precision. They carved bone needles for sewing clothes, crafted ornaments, and left behind cave paintings that still spark wonder today. These weren't just survival strategies. They were expressions of creativity, imagination, and community. Their restlessness also played a key role. Small bands of sapiens traveled far and wide, pushing into new environments, from African savannas to Asian forests and beyond. This urge to move wasn't without risk. Migration often meant hunger, conflict, and death. But it also meant adaptability. Wherever they went, sapiens learned, experimented, and passed down knowledge across generations. If Neanderthals were the steady guardians of Europe's Ice Age, sapiens were the wanderers, bringing new ideas and new ways of living wherever they set foot. When these two species finally crossed paths, it wasn't just a meeting of different bodies. It was a meeting of different ways of thinking, different ways of surviving. Imagine the scene. A band of Homo sapiens weary from weeks of travel emerges from a rocky pass in the Levant. They followed herds, chased water sources, and carried their children on tired shoulders. Ahead, smoke curls into the sky, the sign of another fire. 
But this fire doesn't belong to them. Around it sit figures who look both familiar and strange. The first encounters between Sapiens and Neanderthals were not dramatic battles, as older stories once suggested. Instead, they were moments of curiosity, tension, and slow recognition. At a distance, they might have seemed like rivals. Up close, the similarities were undeniable. Both species used fire. Both hunted large animals. Both cared for their young. They weren't meeting beasts. They were meeting kin. Of course, not every meeting was peaceful. Competition for food and territory sometimes turned violent. Hunters clashing over the same mammoth herd or water source could spark deadly conflict. Yet the evidence suggests something more nuanced than endless war. Archaeological sites reveal overlapping occupation layers, meaning that in some regions they lived side by side for thousands of years, and sometimes the encounters grew even closer. Genetic studies now show that sapiens and Neanderthals interbred multiple times across tens of thousands of years. These weren't rare accidents. They were repeated unions that left traces still carried in our DNA today. So those first meetings weren't just fleeting moments in prehistory. They marked the beginning of a long, complicated relationship, one of rivalry, cooperation, and intimacy. Two species staring across the firelight at each other, realizing they were not alone. Buried deep within the limestone caves of the Levant, archaeologists uncovered a fossil that refused to fit neatly into the categories they had built. It was the partial skeleton of a young child, no older than twelve or thirteen, whose features seemed to tell two stories at once. The rounded forehead and delicate facial structure looked unmistakably like Homo sapiens, but the jaw was broad and heavy, the brow slightly more pronounced, and the proportions hinted at Neanderthal ancestry. This was no ordinary burial. It was a child born of two worlds. For decades, scientists debated how to interpret the find. Some argued it was simply a variation within early sapiens. Others whispered something more radical, interbreeding. But in the 20th century, the idea that two different human species could produce viable children was controversial, even unthinkable. It wasn't until modern genetics entered the scene that the truth could no longer be denied. By extracting and analyzing ancient DNA from Neanderthal bones, scientists confirmed what the fossil record had long been hinting at. These species weren't entirely separate. They had met, mingled, and created children together. The hybrid child from school wasn't a one-off anomaly. It was evidence of a pattern repeated over thousands of years. These unions may have been rare compared to daily life, but they were enough to leave their fingerprints in our genomes today. Every person of non-African ancestry carries between 1 and 2 percent Neanderthal DNA, a genetic echo of encounters like this one. This discovery transformed the way we think about human origins. We weren't a pure line marching out of Africa and conquering the world. We were, and still are, a blend, carrying the legacy of those ancient meetings within us. When scientists first announced that modern humans carry Neanderthal DNA, it sounded almost unbelievable. But the evidence was undeniable. Between 1 to 2 percent of the genome of every non-African person alive today comes from Neanderthals. That may sound small, but the impact is surprisingly big. Some of these inherited genes turned out to be life-saving. For example, certain Neanderthal variants strengthen our immune systems, helping us fight off unfamiliar bacteria and viruses. Others improved our ability to adapt to colder climates, boosting our skin and hair's resilience to frost and low sunlight. In this way, interbreeding wasn't just a chance event. It gave sapiens crucial tools for survival as they pushed into Europe and Asia. But the story isn't entirely rosy. Some Neanderthal DNA is linked to vulnerabilities we still carry today. Variants associated with depression, nicotine addiction, diabetes, and even severe reactions to viruses have been traced back to our ancient cousins. It's as if their DNA was both a gift and a burden, shaping us in ways we're still learning to understand. The most fascinating part? Neanderthal DNA is not spread evenly. Different populations around the world carry different Neanderthal traits depending on where and when their ancestors interbred. This patchwork of inherited fragments means that inside our very cells is a record of prehistoric meetings, written in code and passed forward generation after generation. So when we look at ourselves in the mirror, 
We're not seeing pure sapiens. We're seeing the echoes of an ancient partnership, one that left a lasting imprint not only on our bodies but on our very survival. The discovery of the hybrid child and the Neanderthal DNA still living in us forces us to confront an uncomfortable truth. The old idea of humans as a pure and separate species was never real. Our story has always been more tangled, more shared and more beautiful than that. For centuries, people wanted a clean narrative. Homo sapiens were painted as the chosen ones, destined to inherit the earth, while Neanderthals were cast as a failed experiment. But the evidence tells us otherwise. Neanderthals were not our enemies or our opposites. They were part of us. We carry their blood, their genes, and perhaps even their memories through traditions passed down unknowingly across the ages. This changes how we think about identity. To be human is not to be pure. It is to be mixed, layered, and shaped by countless encounters across time. The firelight meetings between Neanderthals and Sapiens were not just evolutionary footnotes. They were the foundation of who we are today. It also changes how we think about the future. If survival came from connection, not isolation, from mixing, sharing, and learning from others, then our greatest strength has never been standing apart, but coming together. So the next time you hear that human history is a story of conquest and replacement, remember the child from Skull Cave, a child whose face bore the features of two worlds, a child who proves that our species' true legacy isn't about replacing others. It's about carrying them forward within us. In the end, the question isn't what makes us different from Neanderthals. The question is how much of them still lives in us today. For too long, we've told ourselves a simple story, that Homo sapiens triumphed while Neanderthals vanished. But the truth is far richer. We didn't just replace them. We lived alongside them, learned from them, and even raised children together. The hybrid child from School Cave is proof that our history is not a straight line, but a web of connections. Today, fragments of Neanderthal DNA still shape who we are, from our immune systems to our very emotions. We carry their legacy in every cell, silent reminders of ancient firelit nights when two species looked at each other and saw not just rivals, but kin. Being human has never been about purity. It has always been about mixing, adapting, and carrying forward the stories of those who came before us. Neanderthals are not gone. In a very real sense, they are still here, within us.